Welcome to the Fabulous at 50 podcast, where we are changing the aging narrative. I'm your host, Joanne Newaduck, and I'm thrilled to bring you stories that matter and celebrate your place in the world. As an advocate for lifelong learning, health, and women's empowerment, I believe it's never too late to live the life you've always imagined. Through lively and informative interviews with inspiring guests, we'll explore a wide range of topics relevant to our global sisterhood of vibrant, inquiring women just like you. Join me for today's episode and let's start changing the aging narrative together. Hello and welcome to today's episode. Have I got a treat for you. I have the most fascinating woman on as my guest. I met her earlier this year in February at an incredible a business retreat and we just hit it off. We actually met at the airport. You would like out of thousands of people walking through the airport, I knew I was trying to find this lovely lady with gorgeous silver hair and I'm walking through the airport and I look over and I go, oh, I think she's walking right beside me here. So today I welcome a woman who is an incredible artist, a true humanitarian and award-winning, amazing woman. So today I bring you Patricia Gagnick. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Yes. So, Patricia, share a little bit about where you are, where you're living, and I want to kick things off simply just with how did you get into the world of art? Like, what was your journey to get there? Yeah, I have, well, first off, I'm living in Ancaster, Ontario, so um, just outside of Hamilton. I do have a studio in Hamilton. And uh, my career really, truly started, I guess, the minute I was put in a a pencil in my hand, which goes back to when I was about (laughs) three years old. And I started drawing, you know, faces, Elizabethan ball gowns, all things that were not, you know, typical. Um, As time progressed, of course, you know, you're influenced by everything and everybody around you. So I, I ended up becoming a banker. I was a bank manager probably one of the youngest female bank managers when I was about 25 years old. And at that same time, I just continued to draw. And then I was really super fortunate to um, have the support of my husband who said, you know, you really should be painting. You've never tried that. So we bought watercolors. I got started with that. And then, you know, the story evolves into, I ended up going to France to meet, um, to be at this wonderful little village and I was able to see a piece of artwork by an artist by the name of Dragan Dragique. And I was informed he lived in Savoyon in Mont Ventoux in France, about three and a half hours away from La Bigoude de Mazinc, where I was going to be staying. And I, in my brain, said, I need to meet this man. And so... Can I, can I ask, just so I can follow, so you started off as a child, like just drawing more than just yeah. little stick figure people. But oh, yeah. now, now that you're in France, you're a bank manager still, or is this like, I'm just wondering the timeline of when you were yeah, going after so France. I did segue from uh, being a bank manager into starting my own management company, property management, uh, bookkeeping company. It just, I evolved into a number of things. I even built a retirement home, <laughs> operated that for a while. So you know, wearing the left side, right side at all times in my brain, I was just super happy to be, you know, an entrepreneur and discover things. So art was never far away from what I did. And as I operated my my company, I continued to do this, this the artwork. But okay. in 1999, when I met um, Monsieur Dragic and, and he, you know, took me under his wing, which was pretty amazing being a female um, and not living in France, but I ended up going back and forth to France several times a year to be with him for a week or two. And wow, at that what an time, incredible mentor. Yeah. At that time he was, you know, it, what was considered to be the top 10 percentile profound of, of France living in uh, Provencal, wow. 
en Provence. And uh, he, he, he really tapped the shoulders of me wanting to do oil. And so I started working in oil with him. And then gradually, you know, it evolved into the practice of working with acrylic paint. But mm. during the whole time that I was, you know, in my sort of what I would call my my apprenticeship with him, I was exhibiting. I had, you know, taken the roots by meeting a Canadian artist, a Tony Urquhart, the late Tony Urquhart, who was one of Painters 11, and did a master class with him at the university um, in Kitchener-Waterloo. I worked on a number of really unique um, opportunities. So again, I, I was able to attend things through BB International Fine Arts out of Kozlano, Switzerland. He took me under his wing. I was exhibiting at art fairs, so Art Zurich at the Congress House, Art Geneva, wow. South Korea, um, the galleries in, in Berlin. So I had I was getting some really lovely exposure into the art world and learning the ropes of you know, how to manifest in a very, very difficult um, industry. And, Absolutely. Uh, it really sounds like you had quite a, quite a good kickstart there. And what timeline would that be over with that you were going back and forth? Would that be like a 10 year window of time that actually, you were in your apprenticeship, as you said? Yeah, it started again when we went in 1999 and, uh, the first year, so shortly thereafter, his rules were I didn't speak French. I had high school French, so he doesn't speak English. And so this mm. is a bit of a challenge. So yeah. in order for me to, you know, to be with him, I had to hire a tutor. I did, you know, 33 hours of, of you know, direct lessons. And then I had Le Baron. I had all the French books. So I began to you know, start dreaming in French because I was practicing and practicing. But it's funny wow. because even as as I would arrive to be with him, I would I was so uh, intimidated by him. At the same time, I was so nervous that I hardly spoke a word. So I really didn't even need to to do all that hard work. But, the, but so how I beautiful! Stayed. I just want to highlight here that just not only were you going to be an apprentice. For, and to develop your art, but you literally just, on top of that, learned a whole new language, which is it was really more, phenomenal. It, it was complicated because I had, he, he, you know, he spoke Serbian, my husband's Serbian, so I had a little bit of a window into the Serbian mm. language, but I never spoke it fluently. So, yeah, I had to tackle, in addition to, to you know, the language, I never knew, I didn't know that much about, you know, the process, the layering. And so then, because he also, Monsieur Dragic, he doesn't name the colors that we use. We were, we were actually painting with Rembrandt paint by number, which meant that if I wanted to achieve a certain color, I would mix 517 with 506 and a dot of 318. So I had to memorize basically the entire palette and we worked on a piece palette so the challenges Talk about were breaking your brain into gear, Patricia. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was, you know, I think the nicest thing for me though was I was flawlessly dedicated. I just I was so aware of the privilege that I was having to be with this this maestro. So when I had walked into his atelier. And I looked up, you know, he lives in a fifth century home with this massive turret with his, uh, his atelier, his studio upstairs, you know, these winding stairs, all stone. And yeah, wow. I walked up there, I'm seeing posters with his name and beside his name, Picasso, Christo, Atlan, and then a massive, what he calls his press book, this thick, like this thick. And I'm wow. looking at the articles and, and years and years and years he uh, of, you know, his his exposure. And then to realize that he, you know, he wasn't easy on me. There's no question. There were many, many times when I thought, I'm just going to give up. This is this is too mm. hard. I can't do this. But, you know, you, you you just inside of me, I was loving it so much. I was loving the opportunity to be in this situation that I actually set myself up for. And I, yes. and I wanted to go through it. I also think I, I was mission driven. So at the, you know, going back even to my banking, I was, you know, such a young girl out of high school. 
and chose to, you know, go into the bank and be a teller. And then within like five years, I'm a branch manager. And, and then you think about, you know, what was I trying to prove? It was breaking through the, you know, the glass ceiling. Was it personal? Totally personal. I didn't have, you know, to prove anything to anybody, but through the, through the years, and we're going back now, you know, into the early seventies, there was, there were very few opportunities for women in some of those positions. So Mm -hmm. I, I also felt like I can do, I can do this. One, one you were part definitely of that. a trailblazer, definitely a trailblazer oh, yeah. then and a trailblazer now with what you're doing as well. Yeah. yeah. The, the road to this, when people talk about, you know, the obstacles of male, many of my obstacles were also from females. And that, mm. that I, I tell that story because it's like a, a wake up call for people. You know, there you are you're in your, in your senior management position and you're one of like 90 men sitting in a room, you walk back into your environment and a lot of women, you know, their claws come out. Like, who are you? What are you doing? Why do you think you deserve to be there? I had many, many, many challenges, but, uh, from that, overall, Do you find, just to sort of segue a little differently, do you find that that has shifted as you got older? Like, at, like, do you find now? I know that I find, like, sort of, I don't know, things soften. I just find that at least the women I surround myself with now, and I'm hoping you do too, are super supportive. Like, we just want to see each other rise. Have you found that, or, or are you still in an environment where it's a, a little challenging? Um, no, I think the years have softened, as you say, using that word, you know, for many, many reasons. I love the idea, though, that organizations, you know, the WXN, Women's Executive Network, the Universal Women's Network, I mean, multiple, mm-hmm. multiple organizations, which are there to support and bring that sort of sisterhood back into into the reality so that you do not feel the aloneness those organizations did not exist back then so yeah exactly. i think the mentality has changed um many 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 people who are in my my world right now are you know beyond supportive like yourself i mean we we are challenged by other things but at the same time we recognize that if we don't raise each other up if we don't tap on the shoulders of someone else and say, here's an opportunity for this person, you know, give them a chance. That's not going to happen. But there's also a lot now. I think there are many, many men who are in the, in the, with the understanding that boy, oh boy, Nobel prize women and women who have just accelerated uh, are starting to get that recognition. So times have changed and hopefully they'll improve even more. Equanimity will be better. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I want to highlight something else about you. We'll circle back to your art in a little bit. But in addition to all of this incredible stuff you're doing, following your passion and deepening your understanding and your skills in the art world, you are truly a humanitarian and and have a great desire to help others. And I know you were telling me about a project that you did in Cambodia. I'm wondering if you could share that with us today. Thank you. I do have a great, great, great passion about Cambodia. Um, The early story is 2006, a friend of mine was publishing her book about Marco Wasi, the Stone Forest of Peru. She was going to Thailand to have her, her book published, printed. And she said to me, you know, oh, I, I really should take advantage of being there. And so she went to Cambodia and went into Angkor Wat, where she saw this cement pad at the very back of um, Angkor, which was the South Pagoda, and yeah. asked the monk what was going on. And he said, you know, we, we really are trying to build a library and told her the story that, you know, of course, during the time of uh, Pol Pot, the Khmer Rouge, there was a, a genocide. A million people were, were murdered and Horrible. a lot of books were burned. <laughs> the the just, um, history, the folklore, Cambodian folklore was all burned. However, these monks that were in Angor had buried a lot of the paper uh, on, written on wreaths into the stupas in the cemetery. So Master Kawan, who was the head of the temple, 
and gatekeeper felt that after 25 years, it was safe for him. But UNESCO was coming in to make a great deal of change uh, in mm. Angkor, wanted to clean up the grounds. And so the eyesore was this little orphanage that Master Koan was was operating there. And he thought if he built a library and he made it look beautiful, that he would be able to stay and not, not be removed. Mm. But he had no money. So Kathy called me on the spot and she said, I need $5,000. And I said, oh, my God, where, did someone steal your money, your purse? And she said, no, you're building a library. And so <laughs> that's how it started. Do you love friends I, like that? <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyhow... Of course, Kathy came home and and shared with me more of the story, connected me to Sotani Pyung, who was the uh, interpreter at the time. And I I just immediately knew that this was something that I also needed to do. But um, going back a bit, when I was working at the bank in Toronto, and this is 1973, I had hired a young woman who came from Cambodia had was able to escape. So I had this imprint always inside of me about Mm. what had transpired. So I thought it was just so amazing. I really had that connection with her way back in the seventies. And then fast forward, you know, 2006, I'm now in a position of being able to do something. So Mm -hmm. I luckily had the opportunity to go to Cambodia the year after. So I, in 2007, did a a wonderful trip to China and then all the way down to Cambodia. I met Master Kawan. I saw everything that was going on. They had no washrooms, no showers. They had no buildings. It was, it was, you know, war torn bullet Mm -hmm. holes inside of the buildings that were there. So it hit me hard. Yeah. I wanted to do something. So when I got back, um, pulled together some resources and then talked to a few of my friends and we started our mission. So we ended up building washrooms and kitchen and Mm. facilities, really brought it up to snuff, um, built a school for the monks, school for the the poor children. And then again, as years now have gone by, we started um, a a little village in village Romeus, a little school and we bought a, a little plot of land so that the children are able to learn how oh. to look after the sustainability of the land and also their oh, nice. um, their way of just managing money and managing a commitment to the ecology. So it, it's it's been amazing. So it's, yeah, and it <laughs> all really... started from your friend going. You're building a library, but yeah, what you help that... do is you help facilitate to build a community to solidify a community, really. Yeah. We, you know, I think going back for years and years and years, I was involved on, on multiple um, service organizations. You know, I, I was on the board of United Way, um, Big Sisters. Like there was, there was never a minute that I wasn't involved in something also music and art related. Um, And then finding the um, other organization, like coming together with the Rotary. So service above self. I'm a Rotarian, um, work very, you know, close with our passport club in Oakville. I love the, op- I just love the people. I love the incentive of making a difference. And it's small things that can just be that little, you know, push and then something Absolutely. amazing happens. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I'm, uh, I was blown away by that. And I'm actually going to ask you to send me some of the pictures from that as well. Because I think in addition to this podcast, we can put up a blog in our on our website as well with kind of a little bit of the story and at least a little a few of the photos if people are interested in in seeing that because that's hard to do in the show notes when you're talking about a podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to take you, this is now segueing into uh, something else that you mentioned to me at one point, and I would love to hear more about it, is you said you were creating something that was called karmic art experience. And I'm just, can you explain what that is? Yeah, um, I've really, I've studied a lot of um, a different Oh my gosh, like way too many things. I feel like I was Joseph Campbell locked away for five (laughs) years and I just wanted to know everything there was about everything from physics, superluminal particle, neutrino theory, playing chess, all of the above. But I really love 
and always enjoyed learning about the mind. And so yes. I was able to go to the University of Toronto and I, I did two three-year programs uh, back to back, which were applied mindfulness and transformative mindfulness. And when that, when I finished that, I realized that art in many, many ways is a therapy, even though I do not mm -hmm. want to do, you know, a teaching of that. But I was taking the meditation, the mindfulness, and the process of of all that I that I could into what I wanted to give people, which was a karmic art experience. So basically it's tabula oh. rasa. So before COVID, I, I started doing this and I had a small group of people. Everyone gets a canvas and definitely you have, um, you know, certain and specific paints. I walk you through a process of music, um, lit, doing meditation. And then I do the, the words of incentive, like, what are we going to try to master to achieve? And at the end mm. of it, it's probably about a three hour experience. You walk away with a completed painting, but it's also super, super emotional because we work on creating something that you did not realize you had inside of you. It tackles mm. things in a very different way. I've always, you know, I, I've always loved loved words. And as an author, you know, you're always looking at what are the highest and best use of, of your time and how do you achieve or bring somebody into a, a new space. So the combination of art and music really, really seemed to solidify things for me. And I super love doing it. I love helping people. And uh, yeah, so that's going to be launched um, more, you know, professionally, I would say like in a, yeah. in a, business capacity um wonderful in well if you happen to make it out to, to calgary i will definitely sign up for one of those incredible Alrighty experiences then. or maybe when i'm back in ontario visiting next summer if it sounds like a plan like then it Good. it does it does sound wonderful because uh, art and music truly out of everything binds us as a human race regardless of language culture religion anything Mm -hmm. Our art and our music can connect our, it doesn't matter if we speak the same language in words, right? right? So, so for art is, is just so phenomenal. I want to circle back to your art for a little bit because okay. it is quite incredible. And, but you do some really fun things yet. You have your very, um, what would you say your art style is? I think of it as abstract, but I'm wondering, is there a better term for what type of art you do? Uh, I, I, again, it's transformative realism. Okay. My, my theory behind it is complex simplicity where we analyze everything in front of us, but we all have a different way of examining it. I love the etheric idea of taking the emotion and just mm -hmm. playfully allowing it to reveal itself. And so sometimes the paintings can be very, you know, dark. There are other times when they're very, very, you know, mysterious. But that, for the most part, I think is is the it's the truth. It's the soul yeah. revealing itself. Love yeah. it. And because of this depth of your art, you have recently received a wonderful award and and actually a couple. And I know that very recently you just got back from Paris. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah. So I actually just back uh, on yeah. Tuesday and I, I was the recipient At the time it is of recording. <laughs> yeah. Because it'll yes. air in about a week. Yeah. So exactly. yeah. Okay. Within the last week so, or two from listening to this. Yeah. So I was um, honored by the Academic Society Art Sciences and Letters uh, to receive a silver medal in painting. This is actually my third medal to receive. I did receive Fantastic. the uh, silver medal in photography from them and also the uh, pewter medal in painting in previous years. So nice. this, again, it's a, it's a very exceptional uh, event, 600 people in the room and, and you're one of the very few who is recognized as How an international artist. How did that feel to you? you, you you're, you're sometimes feeling, I, you know, not to take it away, but 
of all the artists in the world, you know, it's the why me, but at the same time, then you look back and you, and you say, why not? And, you know, you do your work, you're recognized for it. Um, I did receive another medal, really important one at the Salon Nacional Beaux Art in 2017, which was a gold medal in photography, which was the highest award achievable. And this was held at the Carousel de Louvre in Paris. So again, first female, first Canadian, uh, to receive that honor. And, you know, if you sit Thank back, you, and you, it, you know, <laughs> you. I love that you're saying that if I can point out what's pretty amazing is you started off shattering the glass ceiling for a bit in your world, as far as like young female bank manager back in the seventies. And now, you know, certainly a woman in midlife, and and beyond, like really, we're talking on this podcast often about changing the aging narrative, and and look at you now, you're still doing that, as like you said, first female, first Canadian. You know, it's your you are just. I think you are just getting better and better, which is oh, thank you. fantastic. <laughs> and I I really would love to see where you're going to next. Actually that's a question I'll ask you is like, what's on your horizon next? Do you have, I know that the, the uh, karmic art experience you're launching that, but is there anything else you can give us a little hint on where you're headed? Um, so my, my, uh, so I'll share this. So I literally uh, just a few weeks ago had my 70th birthday. Ooh, so congratulations when, when, and happy birthday. Thank well, thank you. So when you, sort of pool together what's what you've done where you're going and then you look at this window of time and again who knows how much time anyone has but i've made the decision that i'm not going to hold back on anything i don't think i ever have anyways pushing you don't the envelope sound like you have <laughs> yeah pushing the envelope on multiple levels so you know even in consideration of the music you know i i've played guitar since the 70s um, I have a piano, not a very good pianist, um, but I became engaged in drumming. And so literally I was two ask years you about ago, that next. I was going to yeah, ask you about years that. Ago, picked up the sticks and had the fortune of, you know, being taught by a professional um, who is an amazing uh, drummer. So there was percussionist. And I I was just able, the synapses just somehow clicked in for me always, always, always hard, hardcore music person. And so I think I, I heard the beat, the vibration equally as, as I do the painting feeling. So my obsession now is to continue drumming and encourage people like no matter what it is, it's never too late there. You know, I kind of feel like there's no such thing as time. You experience it in this second, in this moment. And You can't be thinking about the future and you can't go back to the past. So why are you wasting your thoughts? Why are you wasting your time thinking Mm -hmm. about should I or shouldn't I, when in fact, that's what you should be doing. If you're even thinking about doing something, then just do it. Why, you know, get, get yourself going on Just keep doing it. it. Like Kim, like your age should be a non-issue. It's like, if you're feeling like this is something you want to do, just do it. Yeah. I mean, age is obviously can hit us with physical, you know, situations as we get older, obviously. But uh, if you can manage to stay in good health and wellness, then by all means, I strongly profess that people stop feeling sorry for yourself. The book I wrote, Karmic Alibi, my tagline is gaining expedient wisdom by leaving your excuses behind. Oh, can you say that again, please? Yeah. So, uh, Karmic alibi is literally gaining gaining expedient wisdom by leaving your excuses behind. Love it. So gain wisdom, leave your excuses behind and just move forward. Like we all have a story. We've all had tragedy in our life. Mine, I've had massive, multiple tragedies in my life that, you know, through those experiences, I could make a decision. Do I feel sorry for myself or do I pick myself up and just say, okay, that happened. What did I learn from it? What can I do to change? Or, you know, will I be able to do something else and shelve it? Like, let it go, put it where it belongs and not Mm -hmm. carry it with me so it becomes a burden. 
the story will be there because it's happened. But I, the narrative of that does not become or define me. It, it certainly grew <laughs> who I have become. And it gives me, you know, more and more opportunity to have better concentration and clarity if that's what I choose to do. Um, do you become somebody as a harbinger for somebody else to to help them to predict their their healing? Yeah, you do. And I think that's why moving myself into next steps, karmic art experience will will definitely be one, continuing to work on new series and and raising the bar on myself to reach out into higher higher levels of exposure, uh, definitely. But uh, I think, you know, with good conscious, you know, effort, being uh, collateral to those that are around you is really important as well. So I, Amazing. I think it's important to maintain your friendships, maintain your relationships as best as you can and, uh, you know, have no regrets. Beautiful. Yeah. So at the end of all of our uh, podcasts, I typically ask somebody, what are your pearls of wisdom? And I think you just shared them. If I can reflect back to you three that I just heard there, and tell okay. me if you have any to add. One, leave your excuses behind in a yep. nutshell. Yeah. The second one I really heard was maintain your relationships. Yeah. Right? Like something in love and relationships. And the third one that what I took out of what you were saying um, in your wisdom was, in a sense, live in the moment live in the moment. We all have tragedy in our life. We all have joy in our life and focus, still honor the stories and the experiences we've had, but don't let it define us. That's what I hear your wisdom. Do you have anything else to add to that before we sign off today? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. So I think one really important thing that I have, I've had to remind myself and so intuition is a monster. It is your number one indicator. So I think pay attention to the intuition, your gut feeling, or the yeah. common sense inside of you. So that's important. And then the other one for me, and this is also a huge, huge, huge one, is uh, hesitation is the biggest crime. It mm-hmm. is. It's, it's that hesitation mm-hmm. on, oh my God, if I had have done that, then this would have happened. I should never have done whatever. Or, you know, sitting at the back of the of the room waiting for someone to recognize you when you don't have your hand up isn't going to happen. So hesitate. And people oftentimes say you hesitate, you lose, you snooze, you lose. And I've learned that multiple, multiple times in my life. And I consider myself to be a converted introvert. And (laughs) that's part of the lesson where I totally have to become much more um out there and and less intimidated by all the things that are around me and just say, okay, I'm here. Whoever's going to judge me will judge me anyways. I can't stop that. But if I, if you can like yourself and then you, you learn how to, to trust your intuition and you don't hesitate, then you can, you can walk into a room and have an amazing result and, and really feel like, oh, this really was supposed to happen or this really did happen for me, not against me. Beautiful. Patricia, I know that in the show notes, we're going to um, share how people can reach out to you. But do you want to just end off by sharing if somebody wants to reach you or how did they get to your website? Yeah, so uh, patriciacarengeigich.com, just simple. Um, my email, I respond I respond to everybody's anyway. So it's patgeigich at gmail.com. I would love to be more on Instagram. I do have Facebook, so I can be found there as well. Yeah. Amazing. Patricia, I just, as you're talking, I'm like, oh, I have this question and that question. So I really do (laughs) hope that I have you on again in the future. I want to hear more about how things are going with your um, karmic uh, art experience and your drumming. And you are just such a fascinating woman. And I'm so honored that we became friends this past year. So thank you for being on. Thank you for inviting me, Joanne. It's been great. Take care. Wonderful. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. But before you leave, I'm curious. What pearl of wisdom are you taking away from today's episode? I do hope it held some inspiration or information for you to live your best life. 
If you are not yet part of our sisterhood, I invite you to join our community by visiting our website, fabulousat50.com, and you'll receive a free copy of our ebook, Make Mind Fabulous, 21 Ways to Energize Your Life. It is packed with loads of tips and tricks. Plus, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a review to let us know what you think. Remember, keep choosing fabulous. It's never too late to live the life you deserve. Catch you on the next episode.